Welcome everyone to the Everyday Experts Podcast. I am your host, Bobby, and at the moment I'm not joined by my co-host Heidi because this is a separate intro I'm recording after the episode you're about to listen to. In our last episode, we talked to Sharla Morris, a death doula in training, about death and how to grieve and process loss in a healthy way. And our conversation was just so dang good, we couldn't fit all the information into our usual episode length, so we decided to give you a two-for-one special. In part two of our conversation with Sharla, we talk about some of the things you'll want to know about logistically planning for your own death or the death of a loved one. But enough out of me, on with the show. Let's let's move a little more into uh, some of the more practical aspects of of death. We've talked a lot about how people process it, how we can help people process it from an emotional standpoint. Do you have, you know, from your training as a death doula and from some of your personal experiences, do you have any advice for people on how they can prepare for their own death? Is there an age they should start completing certain tasks to assist with the process? Is there a certain age where you should start thinking about death more? And, and I I say that knowing that the answer, part of the answer is probably that it depends on the person. Everybody's situation <laughs> is different. But, right. it, you know, in general, is there any advice you can give? Yes. And just as like a caveat for me, what you need to do to prepare for your death is more about the complexity of what you're leaving behind than your age, because we could all die at any time. Mm -hmm. Right. But like how worried, worried is the wrong word. How, you know, concerned, how much attention does my death planning need at 25? Well, if I own three houses and have investment accounts and 50 online subscriptions and a, you know, an automatic debit for, you know, something that nobody's going to know that I am paying for. And maybe I have multiple cars and I have kids and I'm married and, you know, all of that, you absolutely plan at 25, you know, always, I would say wherever you are in your life, whatever age, you should start preparing for your death (laughs) mentally, emotionally, spiritually, um, to find peace with that. And the logistical stuff, again, that depends on, you know, what are your assets and do you need somebody to come dump your alcohol from your house? So your great aunt doesn't see it when they come to (laughs) clean your, (laughs) clean your fridge out, you know, or other various and sundry things that we might want to take care of, you know, also, something to think about. Uh, I I love the practice of Swedish death cleaning. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. We're not, we're not Swedish. (laughs) It can be like really cathartic for the family and the person who's nearing the end of their lives. The idea is that as you get older, you distribute the important things that you have to clear out your home and you live minimally as an elderly person because you've given away the things you love to the people you love. It's this beautiful kind of dynamic that really means that you're leaving a lot less work for your family. So things like minimizing what's going to have to be cleaned out as you get older. Some of us move very frequently like me. (laughs) And luckily, I've not been allowed to (laughs) amass as many things as I think I will have when I'm in one place for many years. But, you know, you can have a lot of stuff that needs to be managed. If you're, you know, I'm, I'm 40. And very comfortable with my own death. Um, I have plans in writing for my children to be cared for um, in case my spouse and I die. We have life insurance policies and beneficiaries updated. We have our accounts and their and the owners written down. We have authorized users on things like, you know, the electric bill. If your family needs to come and clean out your house and nobody can even pay your electric bill because no one's on the account or no one can find a bill, nobody knows the numbers, yes, you can eventually get it done. But in the middle of the grief process is not when you want your family to have to be dealing with logistical issues like that. So there are some great books that can walk you through this. There's also experts like estate planning, elder care attorneys, doulas, death doulas. (laughs) There are death cafes um, that are hosted by people who are usually in the death industry or death 
positive people, which is what we're called. And it's just a place where you can go and everyone around you is assuming death's going to come up. (laughs) And, you know, because when you're sitting at Thanksgiving, it can be weird if you bring up death because I know this because I'm that person. (laughs) I'm like, hey, so do you guys have your, you know, electric company written down anywhere? (laughs) You know, all that. I just bring it up casually with my family because they know who I am. And (laughs) but it can be uncomfortable and you don't want to be off putting to maybe the people in your life because not everybody's there. You know, not everybody is ready to go to a death cafe or take a course to, you know, come to terms with their own death. One of the things that I recommend is the beginner's guide to the end. And I'm pretty sure that's what like everyone I know is getting for Christmas. I'll send you guys some. (laughs) It's, It's the best book. If I have to recommend one resource, that's what I would recommend. It talks about the process of dying. It talks about dealing with a terminal diagnosis, Um, It talks about logistics and emotions and, you know, legacy. What do you want people to remember about you? Is there something you want to do near the end of your life that you think, oh, I really want to, you know, some people in places have started making their own coffins. Have you guys ever seen that Mm -hmm. videos going around online? It's, there are clubs of elderly people that design their own coffins. Okay. And, you know, they're not necessarily terminal. They're older people. <laughs> and that's, like, one way that they can be a, be a, be a part of that process, mm-hmm. you know, and do something that's going to be an interesting memory for their loved ones. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you talk about, you know, the, I just had this thought, like, you know, el- elderly people, like, making their own coffins like that genuinely sounds like something like snl has probably made a skit about before you know (laughs) getting your elderly community to make their own coffins but i think that's that's kind of a reflection on how society treats or at least western society like in america it's kind of how we how we treat death we'll either you know make kind of morbid jokes about Mm -hmm. you know things Mm -hmm. associated with death or you know, you just don't talk about it, right? Life is for the living, you know. You you, or some people have said, um, I'll I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, stuff right. like that. And there, there is this like very negative connotation with even thinking about death. Like, you know, don't even think about that right now. That is so far away. I need to live right now. In the moment. In, in the moment. Exactly. And I, I don't want to think about the, the end. And so it's just interesting. You say, you know, they had, you know, elderly, an elderly community making their own coffins because that is such an unusual activity. I even thought, wow, that's actually kind of morbid. You know, <laughs> hey, here's the here's the box your body is going to be sitting in. You know, like that's just to yeah. me and the way I've been conditioned to think about death. That's a weird Bobby, concept. Can you imagine getting measured for it? Oh no. I'm no. picturing painting it. Can there be like an arts and crafts time where you can like oh, paint the I'm, No, that's what they do, Heidi. Okay. I'm, I'm in. I'm going to send you guys the link. I don't think I want to be buried. I think I want to be cremated. Hmm. You might change your mind. I want to be launched into space. But if I could design and paint my own coffin, I don't know. I might be back in. You want to be launched into space? Is that yes. what you said? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Bobby, one of the things you said, life life is for the living and, you know, I need to be focused on living. One of my favorite quotes um, that I heard just a few years ago is memento mori, memento vivere. And my Latin sucks, but that's how I say it in my head. (laughs) And it means, remember, you must die and remember to live. Mm -hmm. And I got this necklace with that because I think there are two sides to the same coin. There's this, uh, shop that makes coins called Shire Post Met and I love them anyway. They they make a coin like this and it's got the skull and you know I know when people see this pendant that I'm wearing on a necklace it's probably like, oh she's a little morbid. Is she like goth or something? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just such a beautiful reminder that hey, you're going to die. Live fully. Embrace that there's an end because that allows you to embrace right now even more. Yeah, absolutely. But the Heidi, I was thinking the options that most people know about Mm -hmm. are not the only options out there. For burial, for Mm -hmm. cremation, or for... Yes. Yeah. For the disposition of your corpse. (laughs) There you go. That sounds so 
technical. I know the word the word corpse is very off putting, and and even the word death, dying, those are words that we avoid. <laughs> yeah, we go for passed away or yeah, yeah. Moved, moved on, moved on, right? Yeah, on no longer better. with us. Yeah. What are some of the different options for? What, what was your technical term <laughs> for your corpse? Yes, disposition of disposition the corpse. of your corpse. What you are can, some of those options? You can design and paint your own coffin. What else okay. is on the table? You could. Yes, I would recommend an eco-friendly biodegradable paint, especially if you're getting a wood coffin. But this is really like an exciting topic for me, and I'm really passionate about it. Probably because I'm also a complete nature geek, and I love that there is a way, or m- multiple ways, that our bodies can actually feed back into the system of the ecosystem Mm -hmm. of the earth. You know, we can be a part of this super cool process where energy is used and used and used and used and passed around. And, you know, the most common thing that we maybe have been to a funeral and seen is that, uh, you know, we'll have like a traditional funeral in a funeral home, usually a casket. Uh, A casket is a big box, (laughs) usually not wood, usually not shaped like Dracula would come out of it (laughs) or a mummy (laughs) or anything. Um, Everybody knows what a casket is, right? It's got the fabric in it. And, you know, they come out with all these new high tech, like this is impermeable for 4,000 years. Like, okay, great. What good is your body doing decaying in a box? And that, again, I think our attachment to that is this idea that I'm fighting death, right? Like preserve the remains. Yeah, you don't you don't get my body. Mm. Right. That's mine forever. <laughs> you know, and there are some religious practices which don't allow for cremation or other ways of breaking the body down because they believe the body needs to be intact to be resurrected in the afterlife. Like when cremation, I think it was like the 1880s, it started coming back into popularity. Of course, you know, go back and back funeral pyres, you know, burning the dead was often done as a a practical way to get rid of disease and, and remains for centuries. But the idea of cremation was especially off-putting. Like the Catholic church had a very strong opinion that you couldn't be resurrected if you were ashes, you know? Around the 60s, I think, they changed their mind, and now you can be cremated, but your ashes have to stay together. They can't be spread. There was a quote I saw that was something like, it was from the 60s, and some quote, and they said, God can resurrect a bowl of ashes as well as he can resurrect a bowl of bones. (laughs) But yeah, so there was a lot of pushback to cremation, which we all know of as well as an option. Your body is heated to a very high temperature. All the flesh is burned away, and what's left is some ash and bones, and those are ground up, and your family gets to keep them or spread them um, or shoot them into space, Bobby, if you'd like to be shot into space. (laughs) Actually, I I will say one of my favorite uh, comedians named Dimitri Martin, (laughs) he told a joke once where he said that, one, he either at his burial, he wanted them to cremate his bottom half. (laughs) <laughs> and spread, hold on, and spread the ashes out. And then the top half of him is dressed like a genie. Oh. <laughs> and then, and then he wanted them to put the ashes into a little hourglass. Like, to I play. mean, and he's always there for game night. <laughs> exactly. That that was his thing. He's like, oh, hey, we're uh, going to play Scattergory. Somebody grab Grandpa. I'm not grand- opposed to that. Somebody grab Grandpa off the mantle. Totally want to be a game so night. I'm here for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I just, so uh, I always appreciated the whole, like, dressed up like a genie yeah. thing. Uh, I, that, you know what? That's what I want to do. I think I, I might never mind the idea. space thing. You... Well, I guess you can still shoot the, the remains after that point into space. So you have about, I think, 3% of your body mass is left after cremation. So an adult body of, you know, average size, you're going to have a lot of ashes. So you could do a lot of different things with them. You could shoot some into space and also be a genie. You can make, there are artists who will do commissions where they will actually make paints with the ashes and paint pictures. You can do jewelry. Mm -hmm. I think you can get made into a diamond. You can do all sorts of things with ashes now. And it's kind of cool 
especially the jewelry piece and some of the resin work, because people may have right now that are listening, like remains that are sitting in the top of a closet or on, you know, maybe in pride of place on the mantle, but having that, you know, necklace that has a little piece of them that can go with you. Again, this is another way to maintain that connection to your Mm -hmm. loved one. And that's a really healthy thing. I think there are also ways where, I don't know how it works, but I've seen like trees, like in like you're, you're buried somehow under the tree and you're, (laughs) I don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have, you know, this traditional American burial where we are in a cement um, vault and inside that is the casket and inside that is the body that has been probably embalmed, Mm -hmm. which by the way, you don't have to be embalmed. People don't know this. You don't have to be embalmed and you break down a lot sooner if you're not. (laughs) And you break down without really, really toxic chemicals, which is one of the concerns that scientists are thinking about and trying to come up with other ways to dispose of bodies. After people have passed, what do we do with these remains that is respectful, but also can sort of not ruin the environment? And because there's more and more people all the time. (laughs) So we've run out of space. And then with the embalming, that was really gaining in popularity around the time cremation was gaining in popularity in the early 1900s, the technology for embalming, like we can make them look lifelike again. You know, we can, we can bring your loved one back to life. You can have this open casket and they're going to look like they're here with you. And again, it's that separation from death. We don't want them to look dead. We don't want them to appear other than they're just asleep, right? That's, that's what we want. Oh, they were so peaceful. They looked like they were asleep. So now you have really involved processes for preserving bodies before a viewing or anything. But if you don't want to go that route, you can also, a lot of states have legislation right now for something called aquamation. Aquamation uses, I think, a fourth of the energy of cremation. Of course, you don't have the smoke. A lot of people don't realize when they choose cremation, it is a better alternative than a you know, traditional American burial. I don't know, put that in quotes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> cremation uses a lot of energy and it actually produces a lot of smog. Mm-hmm. Sadly, I don't know if you saw the news, but during COVID, LA, the sky was black because they were cremating so many bodies and the air quality that, you know, they had air quality alerts from the crematoriums mm. because they were just working night and day. And that is a horrible example of you know, the smaller amounts that we see day to day as people are running, you know, crematoriums. Um, But with aquamation, you actually don't have that and you have much less power and you get the same thing as a family member at the end, the bones are left Hmm. and, you know, you have a certain percentage of their remains with you that you can still use. They're crushed up, but it's alkaline hydrolysis. I actually had to write that down because I could never remember it. (laughs) But essentially, it's acid. Mm. And so you're, you're put in a chamber. You're not there. Your body, your remains are put into a chamber. And good to clarify that you you are dead when this process starts. Essentially, they're using a liquid instead of fire. That's the only difference. But the environmental impact is much better. It's all very processed. All that's left at the end are like amino acids and, you know, Mm. some biological (laughs) components, but it's all filtered. It's people have a lot of feelings about it because they're afraid like, oh, I'm going to go down the drain or does that go in the drinking water? You know? Well, I'm sure people have a lot of feelings about every way. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. But uh, there's something about the way we think about our own body or our loved one's body Mm. being treated. Again, I mean, there's still people who feel strongly that you shouldn't separate the ashes. You know, some people shoot part of the ashes into space. Other people, it's on the mantle in the urn and it would be desecration to separate those remains. And so, you know, kind of finding where you are and how important 
the environment is to you and what your budget is and what's legal in your state. Um, you can also do just a natural burial. Sometimes that still has to be, that can be as natural as you want, I should say. <laughs> All the way from choosing not to be embalmed, which is, in my opinion, a step in the right direction to kind of have less negative impact after death. All the way to like a home funeral uh, where you're buried just in the ground in a shroud that will break down. And there are lots of cemeteries popping up where you actually don't need the cement vault anymore. And they're even doing like restoration projects in those areas because, of course, the soil is rich and beautiful and loamy and they can do a lot with it. The most exciting thing for me as a nature geek is human composting. And that also sounds not great to some people. <laughs> you know, who wants the human composting center in their backyard, right? Oh. But it's actually legal here in Washington. I found out about it before I even moved here. But within 30 to 60 days, there's nothing left but soil. Huh. Yeah. And you couldn't find traces of DNA. You're literally completely broken down. And these scientists, they created pods. <laughs> and you can go have your ceremony at the receiving center or whatever they call it. I can't remember. Um, at their center, you have a, a pod and it has you know mulch and hay and flowers and lots of beautiful things. They have the right they did a lot of research to find the right combination of ingredients that will break down um, a human body very quickly. And that allows them to have a lot of really efficient uh, disposal that is beneficial because at the end, your family gets like, I don't know, a cubit of soil <laughs> or it can go to, you know, a local wildlife preserve that they're, you know, doing a meadow habitat or something, you know. And that really is like the coolest thing to me that the tree pods are in, as of my last time that I looked, which has been a, a little while, the tree pods weren't actually up and running in the way that most people think they do. As in my body is put inside some sort of receptacle and I'm underneath the tree feeding the tree. To my knowledge, I don't think that's what's happening yet. I think they're using ash remains and you're kind of like dedicated to a tree but um, they want to get to the pod thing eventually which would be very cool but again that would be kind of I would think an expensive process compared to the composting you know mm -hmm. where you're there and gone and then you're just dirt <laughs> you know with trees with trees you do have the legality of now does my family own this plot of land the trees on what if the tree dies? I know. What that's if... the other thing I was going to say. You always yeah. run that risk with plant life. Yeah. <laughs> Being a memorial, but... you know, like <laughs> can be sensitive later. Yeah. So, yeah, there are a lot of options. And I think finding what's legal near you um, is obviously the first step. And usually, you know, a Google search will turn up some options. If you have any death doulas in your area, they would know end of life planners or I would probably not check with the funeral home. <laughs> There's kind of a a big industry aspect mm -hmm. to funeral homes sure. where yeah. you walk in and it can it can be a very high pressure sales situation where your grief is kind of preyed upon and you're forced even when maybe you wouldn't have made that decision a week earlier you buy a $30,000 casket that's never going to let your loved one decay sure. because they deserve the best, you know? And maybe your loved one is me and is absolutely horrified that you would go into debt and not let my body decay in the earth. <laughs> <laughs> but if we don't ever have these conversations, then it can be hard to know what they want. So, Sharla, you said, you know, check in for your area to see if there are mm -hmm. any death doulas in your area to ask for advice. Well, how do people find a death doula in case they are interested in having that support? Oh, absolutely. I would say Google. <laughs> 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 I would Google death doula near me and then skip the first few ads on the top of the page and get to the get to the good stuff, the meat and potatoes. 
and reach out from there. And, you know, maybe that death doula really doesn't focus on end of life planning. And she's really about sitting vigil with people who are at the end of their life um, and being at the bedside, you know. All of us are going to have our own kind of specialties and our own backgrounds. Uh, Some death doulas come from a medical background. Some come from accounting. The doula that runs the training I did, her name is Alua Arthur, and she was an attorney. And she kept having people come to her and ask for help. And she's like, well, I don't do end of death. And these people needed help. And through her own journey... Now she can use that law degree and her empathy and skills as a death doula together. So that's great. Well, I think that's about all we have time for for uh, for this episode. Charlotte, we thank you so much for coming on the show and and talking about something that is generally considered uncomfortable. We we knew going into it that this was going to be one of the you know possibly heavier episodes. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that should always be the case. Death is obviously, it's sad, but it does need to be talked about. And Mm -hmm. our goal in having you on this show is to help normalize those conversations and, you know, let people know what their options are for, you know, preparing for their own death, helping family members and friends prepare for their deaths. And then, you know, on a personal level, how to how to cope with death and grief mm-hmm. and help others navigate that. So I, th- I think what you've shared today, Sharla has been incredibly valuable and in sharing your perspective and helping other people have a blueprint for navigating death in general. You've been a great expert. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm glad I was able to talk about it. And I do think it's so important to get this information out there and let people know they have options and they can have they can have a good death. Yes. That yes. I'm actually glad you said that. You you can have a good death. It doesn't have to be I think you said earlier, it doesn't have to be like a miserable process. Obviously right. it will be sad, but it doesn't have to be terrible. So Mm -hmm. hopefully we can help you, the listeners, get a better idea of how to normalize conversations about death and make it as positive a part of your life as it is able to be. So again, we thank you, Charlotte, for being with us today. Heidi, thank you as always for showing up for these recordings. (laughs) Just sat over here in the corner, (laughs) twiddling my thumb. I'm here. Yeah. (laughs) Well, we appreciate you all for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. If you know an everyday expert that you think we should talk to, leave a comment below or send a message to the email address in the description. If you're an expert yourself, we want to talk to you too. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get more awesome content and updates on future episodes. See you next time.